For $5 a month, you can actually see the Thin Green Line interviews and other video content on Patreon.com. Just search the Thin Green Line podcast on Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com and feel like you're part of the conversation. Join us. On this episode of the Thin Green Line, our guest is Gabriella Hoffman. And Gabriella's got a whole bunch of things she does. One of the things a social media strategist always jumps out at me because that sounds really important and really <laughs> strategic. And I like that kind of stuff. So that, that hits me right away, Gabriella. Actually, you caught me right off guard when I first started the Warden's Watch podcast by giving me a nice shout out there. So that's where I started looking at what you were doing and how you were doing it and being in <laughs> the central part of the country where most of us that love the outdoors don't want to be and you're engaging in a lot of different right. things in that area and we certainly need people like you. So it's an it's, it's honor to have you on our show, huh, John? Gabriella, welcome. It sure is, Wayne. And um, like Wayne said, Gabriella, you bring such a unique element to be a, a, you know, a passionate, thin green line proponent, if you will, on conservation as a whole, but coming from an area that you just don't see that, that's, you know, that's kind of all throughout the country. So we're excited to have you on today and uh, we got a lot to talk about. I'm very excited to break down some issues. I've been listening and enjoying the podcast and really respect the work that game wardens like yourselves, past and present and future do. You guys do a lot of great work and you guys don't get enough appreciation for your efforts to make it possible for us to fish and hunt. No, and we certainly want to continue on as uh, retired officers, being a little more vocal, telling those stories. I always say it's behind the scenes. You get so much with Wild Justice and uh, Northwoods Law, uh, and I don't want to forget our, our people in the Texas, and that's, you know, the Lone Star Law as well. You get all that things, but it's amazing what they cut and cut and paste and they drop on the floor. It's amazing how much video they right. shoot and don't use. So I always call it the, the back stage of those programs so you actually get to hear some of the stories and maybe some of the things you want to hear and then we we started this thin green line because yeah it was great telling their stories but there's a lot of issues that we want to get into we want to have different guests like yourself on a show and being engaged actively engaged in promoting what we think is necessary and trying to preserve what what we like as far as the outdoors goes. And a lot of that is starting to slip away. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. And, and it was it was interesting to me because before all, all of COVID-19, it seemed like millennials were gravitating to cities. There were studies done and millennials were heading to the cities. So they're going to lose all those issues that we address in the rural areas and then in the remote areas. So we're going to lose all that contact unless we contact them, A, through this type of media or engage them, but COVID-19 happens and then there's a mass migration and now we're seeing people running from the cities. <laughs> Is that what you're seeing, Gabrielle? I think so. I live like 20 miles outside of Washington, D.C. proper. So there are a lot of houses that are for sale and then immediately bought. Even in my neighborhood, I live in the Fairfax County portion of Alexandria, Virginia, and you do see a lot of people gravitating towards the suburbs just because of a multitude of factors, certainly triggered by the virus. And I think a lot more people, if they're starting their family, uh, now they have a reason to move to the suburb, especially if they're worried about safety in the cities um, and just other issues. So, yeah, I, I wonder how it's going to change, let's say, conservation and, and outreach. So that's something we can certainly explore in this episode. So, Gabriella, going going back, um, just tell us your background a little bit for our viewers and listeners that are, are coming into this fresh. Um, where did you get this passion? Where did it start from you in childhood? Was there a transition point? And then to be where you're at, kind of at the political hub, you know, of our of our great nation, where you're going with it now? Just just take us back to the beginning and um, what what really inspired you. Absolutely, I would say that. The love of the outdoors was certainly something passed in the bloodstream. So my father, I think it's a usual thing for young men and young women to be largely influenced by their fathers. That certainly was the case, I think, for my generation. But now we're actually seeing, interestingly enough, women are teaching their kids how to hunt and especially how to fish. But I think I still come from the generation where we looked to our dads to go to the outdoors. And my father is an avid outdoorsman, particularly a fisherman. And he is from the Baltic nation of Lithuania, which was under communist rule for much of the 20th century. And 
even with all the limitations that he had there, he was able to go fishing. And he was probably the only one in my immediate family who did it. He used to fish for bream. He would always recount fishing in the streams outside of the city. He grew up in the city of Vilnius, which is the capital. But he, although being a city boy, he used to love the outdoors. And it was kind of a oxymoron for him to be such an example of a, <laughs> an avid fisherman. But even there, uh, he just grew to love the sport. I think he was influenced by a family friend or a distant relative. I can't recall who exactly in my family uh, influenced him if it was a family friend. But he picked up fishing at a really young age. And in lieu of him not having boys, uh, it's me and my younger sister, he was like, you know, the best way I think to bond with you, <laughs> young little girl, is to go fishing. <laughs> And I first picked up a spin rod and I think a bait rod too at eight years old. And I started catching nice. little fish. There are some pictures I was actually looking back on. And I grew up in Southern California. And I actually noticed a theme among your initial guests for the Thin Green Line so far. A lot of us have roots in California, but I grew up in Southern California. And my playground for fishing was there. And my dad got me kind of situated into it when I was eight. And it was during Memorial Day weekend of 20 or 2003 I was 12 years old at the time and my dad took me to this Huckleberry Pond in Orange County which were which was the place we grew up in and I hooked in this humongous catfish I think for a for a 12 year old it was pretty big at 8.9 pounds 28 wow. and a half inches and I remember I remember the measurements uh to this day and I can't find the photo of it unfortunately but I remember it vividly in my mind and from that instant despite briefly dabbling into fishing and catching some trout and some little fish. Uh, it was that moment where I really solidified my love of fishing and studies from, let's say the recreational boating and fishing foundation say that if you hook into fishing before 18, 90% of the time, you're going to keep that hobby with you for the rest of your life. That's not foolproof nice. of course, because some people certainly pick up a love of fishing later, but when you do start early and I was very lucky to start early, you do likely keep, an interest in it for a lifetime. So I'm, I'm really proud to say that that was the case for me. And then uh, I'm fairly new to hunting and shooting sports. So I first picked up a gun when I was 19. And that was the winter of 2010. I went to go shooting in the mountains with some friends. And at first, I didn't like the experience. I didn't like shooting from a shotgun, but I enjoyed shooting from a handgun. And when I moved to Washington, DC area after finishing college, I got really interested in it. Because People I worked with in politics were involved in the policy side of firearms ownership. And I started to do that. And then I got my concealed handgun permit. And then I got a handgun afterwards. I still had to do a lot of training, even though I've been shooting a little bit, you know, for five to 10 years, give or take. But you're always having to learn. And I picked up hunting, I would say, three to four years ago. So I'm an adult onset hunter, as we like to say in the industry. But it was kind of a natural progression having a father who loved the outdoors. He also loved to do mushroom hunting. We like to go foraging for that uh, to this day, and it's a lot of fun, or berry picking. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a full-spectrum thing when you come from Eastern Europe, and especially from a country as naturalistic as Lithuania. There's a lot of natural geography. The topography is beautiful. There's a lot of rivers and streams and oceans. You're just kind of sucked into the outdoors. So I had no choice but to love the outdoors, but I developed a natural love for it as well, and I credit my dad for doing so. And in terms of how I got into this from a freelance journalist commentary type role, I kind of noticed that there's a lot of misinformation and kind of lack of attention to these issues. We often see a lot of mainstream media sources botch very finite, important details. Let's say in the instance of grizzly bears, they think grizzly bear hunting can take place in Yellowstone National Park when it's not the Yellowstone National Park, it's the greater <laughs> Yellowstone ecosystem. I actually forced Wall Street Journal to correct that. <laughs> and um, so, <laughs> so you, you see those details where they don't understand the nomenclature associated with wildlife conservation or firearms. And a lot of reporters are not embedded in these activities. They don't go fishing. They don't go hunting. So they're removed from it. And they may have a disdain for it. So they're writing from the view of a more preservationist standpoint. And they're not giving all key conservation stakeholders their proper due. So in my evolution as a freelance journalist and commentator, I recognized the deficits among my colleagues in media. And I was like, since I'm immersed in this, since I can learn about this even more, 
And since I talk to a lot of people, I have a lot of sources. I like to network with different people, hear different people's stories. I'm really keen on storytelling. I was like, I should start covering this beat. And I first started doing so for a publication called Wide Open Spaces. And it was during my, uh, I think it was a year before I became a freelance media consultant and strategist. I think it was fall 2015 when I started to really take an interest in this beat. And from there, it moved to uh, talking about this issue at another publication called The Resurgent, which is a conservative political online website where I spent four years talking about these issues at great length. I returned to townhall.com, which is also conservative, but I also tried to talk about these issues from a, I would say, uh, even keeled, not partisan way, but it still kind of comes across as conservative, politically speaking, I guess. Sure, and sure. I, I brought, I tried to bring those issues back to the publication now that I'm there in a more formal capacity. And before going back to town hall, I did a full year of going full throttle with outdoor writing. I spent about a year at Sporting Classics Daily where I would contribute articles about bears. Uh, I talked about some storytellers in the outdoor industry. I wrote about the grizzly bear situation, which I know we'll probably talk about more at length here. And I won an award through my outdoor media association, professional outdoor media association, which is really great. And if Your listeners have a question about how to get into outdoor media. I'm happy to answer those questions. So I think that'd be a really fun subject to explore a bit more. But I won an award about a year ago for my coverage on it. And it was really cool just to be commended and honored for that reporting because it is such a controversial topic. So I like finding controversial subjects, uh, giving a voice to storytellers and lending their perspective to the greater discussion about wildlife conservation because so many of them are shut out. And I think now what we see, I think, in the federal government, we see this in the Department of Interior, Fish and Wildlife, you see a lot more stakeholders getting a voice when they were shut out from the conversation previously. So that's kind of my background in a nutshell and, and what I do. Yeah, that's awesome. It's a, it, it's neat to see it start in childhood. And it needs, uh, it's awesome to see you paying it forward now. And uh, I'm sure Wayne's going to have some similar questions. We've kind of talked about where you're at and how influential you can be in the position you're in because mm-hmm. of your media exposure, because of writing. And like you said, we're starting to see a little more of a balanced conservation voice at our upper levels of politics with the Department of Interior, with some of the head sheds that are in the Department of Interior mm-hmm. now. And us both being from game warden backgrounds and me coming from a very political, preservationist, slanted state as it's kind of become in California. Yeah. But having a couple of diehard politicos that like the balance of conservation where it's needed, and you mentioned the grizzly bear, which we should definitely dive into more, and the mm-hmm. controversy of management versus hunting in some states, just like our mountain lion in California, as I'm sure you're familiar with when we were back there. But great stuff, and um, it's really cool to see what you're what you're doing there. And um, I'm sure Wayne has another question, but we want to definitely talk about issues like the grizzly, but how you approach them to unify as opposed to not polarize especially in these times where everything's so divisive. Yeah, well, briefly, and then I'll, I'll certainly let Wayne chime in, of course. I think there's a way of, uh, to go about it where you can present that issue from a pretty even-keeled, non-controversial standpoint where you talk about who is affected by situations like that. Uh, individuals, state governments, scientists who deal directly with the grizzly bear population, businesses, tourism bureaus, outfitter guides, And you're seeing a lot of interesting interests actually come together to combat, let's say, these efforts to delist the grizzly bear. And and perhaps I think soon we're going to see delisting efforts with pertaining to the gray wolf. I think that is on the horizon as well. That's another contentious issue, which doesn't have to be contentious, but certainly there's a lot of emotion attached to it because people are very animated and very passionate about them. And I think those of us who go hunting or support hunting too – support those animals and want those animals to thrive and exist, but we have different approaches for management um, and and more scientific (laughs) approaches to management too. But I think if those topics are talked about in a scientific manner, which they are, uh, from what you hear testimony from wildlife agency representatives when they were testifying about the grizzly bear, for instance, they rooted their decision in supporting delisting efforts from their studies, from observing bear habits, how they've exceeded their carrying capacity, how they've expanded their range, and just how these conflicts between humans and bears has become more prevalent without a proper management system in place. So I think if you come about it from a rational, scientific-based approach, I think you can even get undecideds 
to also uh, consider it as well. You, you know, Gabriela, that, that's the key right there, because I'm, I'm coming from northwestern Montana, where I'm right on the edge of Glacier National Park. And I mean, we are so and, and it's a lucky thing to have such a viable and, you know, um, thriving population of, of inland grizzly bears. But we also get the problem bears out of Glacier. They get dumped in the Yak Wilderness where I'm at. They get dumped in the Cabinet Mountains. There's hunter and angler and backpacking equestrian, you know, interaction with these bears that are very used to people. And that talk has been generated up here in this part of the country of, are we going to delist? Are we going to regulate either for a management, a limited hunt standpoint? Um, kind of like we've already done with the wolf up here in Montana, where again, populations are thriving, livestock elk populations are being hindered. And we have a wolf hunt that's structured very carefully. And we've seen that problem dwindle just a little bit when it comes to other native species like elk and like mule deer and like whitetail and also livestock. And we're really not putting uh, a significant dent on that wolf population. And it's becoming a lot more palatable from both sides of the fence when they start seeing the benefits, when it, when it starts affecting them directly on in holdings of land we have up here in such rural tracts. So that's a great point you make, but it's all in the delivery, you know, and, and how you approach it. And just giving people the information of the scientific data that when they can get past that emotional side of the argument and go, how can I really argue this, that the animal's going to do better as a whole in the conservation model and do less damage to public safety threats or depredation threats, whatever the case may be. But it's been a very hard sell for um, certainly us as game wardens with, and I go back to the California experience with the mountain lion. I mean, now that I'm in Montana, it's, it's the grizzly bear. Transplant yeah. the two animals, same sentiment. And the science behind both say there needs to be some semblance of management done carefully and structured and regulation needs to be very careful so we don't overdo it. But it's getting past an emotional contention. I like how you phrase that. It's spot on. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost in motions versus science is from what I see. And yep. to take those people that are emotional about it and convince them otherwise is a feat. John, you see that in California. I mean, and the things I see that are transforming instead of hunters managing populations, that it's going to the government, it's going to the states to manage those for extra costs. Uh, we have a, the beaver trapping was outlawed in Massachusetts. There's still all kinds of beaver issues. They just created another job, trappers that professionally do it, people that have to pay for it, they're probably taking the same amount of animals, if not more, but we're transforming that, what we used to take with trappers and maintain it and have an outdoor enjoyment for someone who enjoys trapping, having a healthy population of beavers. Now we've changed it so the government is taking it over and the whether it's municipalities, state government, taking that and putting their efforts into that as well as costs and things like that, which is just um, what, I, what I don't want to see. And that seems to be a trend nationwide, uh, which is just uh, sad with the, the, the mountain lion, like you said, John, in California. Again, emotions won. And politicians, you know, they look at numbers. They look at votes. So they look at the people calling them and right. how they need to vote. And that's, that's so hard. Our Fish and game departments nationwide generally are structured so they can use that science and create rules. But then when it goes to the legislator, it gets overruled and they don't listen to the science. They listen to the emotion and the amount of voters that come through that door, which is just a slippery slope that I'm seeing our country slide on as far as managing animals on an emotional basis rather than a scientific basis. And it sounds like you engage that right up front, Gabriella, in trying to swing those people and I, I think you probably do have a little more patience than, than I do. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, del the delicate uh, job of uh, being politically correct but getting getting the right message across and Gabrielle I got to hitch up with this because Wayne just hit it on the head it's it's kind of the frame of reference if not political sentiment of the majority of votes that do drive our politics and i'll take my old state of california as an example but it's in every state um, mm -hmm. i'm only speaking from experience on the mountain lion issue but something wayne and i have talked about in other podcasts that you may have seen bits of is since covid started since uh, a, a very left-based youth um group if you will a populace that have never been exposed to hunting and really spent a lot of the outdoors coming from our urban center were very anti-hunting didn't want to own guns didn't want to have anything to do with that that aspect of it i'm completely against 
COVID dropped, meat shortages, you know, were, were starting to happen. We thought this thing could get worse before it was going to get better. And all of a sudden we had this wave of gun sales, you know, from typical non-gun owners that come from, you know, more of a left versus the right side for lack of anything else. And then this, I think in April, Wayne, correct me if I'm wrong, but we had like a 25, 30% surge in hunter safety classes being approached and passed and hunting license sales going on nationally in some of the quote unquote non hunting states. Do you see that as kind of the catalyst for a little more unifying open minded nature of accepting some of this data and looking at hunting and conservation as a whole or the conservation model being a little more palatable even after COVID does dwindle or, you know, I, are we, are we in a, going in a good direction, which we certainly think we are, but what do you see on your side? Yeah, I think, we will probably see shifting opinion, but I wanted to answer, kind of uh, respond to you in terms of uh, legislatures uh, taking kind of anti-scientific approaches to wildlife issues. So I think it was earlier this year before COVID hit, I had never seen a record number of state legislatures picking up uh, predator hunting bans, trapping bans, and all these other bills that would restrict timeless, uh, helpful means of conserving or managing species. And I know that fur bearing activities have certainly declined over the years. And I think it was at the turn of the 20th century, a lot of this uh, animal rights activity and this, let's say animal uh, anthropomorphic type of assigning to animals started to take hold. And I used to love Disney, but I, I assign a lot of blame to Disney for, <laughs> for kind of a, destroying people's views on wildlife. <laughs> but it, oh, I think, it's good. Yeah. But, but I think so many people just derive their thinking of wildlife from these sources, these not realistic sources. And now it's taking shape in the public policy debate. And it's becoming problematic and you're going to see declines in revenue streams. I know Wayne in your state there, I spoke to actually a gentleman, a fur trapper who was really fascinating. His name is Jeff Trainer. I don't know if you've ever come across with him, but I found his uh, discussions about fur trapping and then the need for that to be really compelling, even in this day and age and how in the Northeast, especially how it used to be a timeless tradition. People did it, uh, you know, when the country was founded, it was pretty common then and now how it's, very limited. And I know uh, for you, John, that in California, too, I think they just banned a bill on fur trapping or trapping because only like 100 people or so had licenses to go trapping. And we're just seeing uh, these kind of subtract subtractive uh, measures come in California's legislature. I've been very critical of Sacramento and I share your frustrations with them, too. But it's it's just been so disappointing to see California, which is considered a very outdoorsy state, arguably the most outdoorsy state, taking these extreme positions and alienating hunters and anglers. I think they're going to be considering a bill that would limit recreational fishing in the ocean even further on top of the Marine Land Protection Act. And I think 30 percent right. of access is going to be cut for recreational opportunities on the ocean with these uh, marine protections that are going to be assigned to these really popular fishing spots. So yeah, the radicalization, I would say, of wildlife policy is problematic. And perhaps with people coming into the fold with these license surges across fishing and hunting, people are going to learn about the standards, the conservation ethics, and everything in between and just get acclimated. And if they come in and try to change things to discourage that, that could be a problem. We hopefully have to bring them in, especially people my age, I'm almost 30, millennials like myself, and just kind of get them acclimated to the industry, teach them the ropes and explain to them this history and kind of this mechanism we have in place. Yeah, I think you hit it on the head there. That is hypercritical is millennials of your generation and, and following, you know, when I look at nieces, nephews, uh, kids and families and everybody else that we tr we're trying to have that subtle impact on. But to your point back on using California's example of politics, we did lose, we, we had the trapping legislation come through. We also lost complete bobcat hunting mm -hmm. January 1st of this year. And that was based on uh, a research model that let's go study cats. We haven't had a good enough study and we're just going to ban it for now and kind of see what's going to happen here. But, but again, when it comes to predator control in very outdoor states like California that have a ton of resource and have a lot of depredation interaction with house pets, with livestock, you name it, that was a real hit, you know, from the standpoint of the conservation model, what they're looking at from the standpoint of even coyotes and other predators that whether or not they have fur bearing trade value, 
those impacts could be very negative to, you know, the whole balance overall when, when it comes to a balance of species, as you know. So the more we can do to affect that millennial group and everything you're doing in that age bracket and, and next to come is, is super important. And uh, we definitely agree that this increase in hunting license sales, an increase of a panic of, oh, no, I might have to fend for myself, although it may be a little extreme and we hope it doesn't come to that. It mm-hmm. seems to be engendering a little more open-mindedness, and I, and certainly seems that with the work you're doing, hopefully that's going to make your efforts and our efforts coming from two prongs a little easier, especially in those pivotal states like these urban centers and, and going back to Cali as an example. Absolutely. And when I was growing up, I was living close to Silverado Canyon where that really horrific mountain lion attack occurred. I think it was Uh one. Uh Yeah, there were several bikers who were killed. Uh, There was one woman who survived. I think she's still around today. And that was very scary. And I lived for a time in Cota de Casa, Trabuco Canyon. And we had a mountain lion come to the golf course about a block or two down. I lived on an elevated kind of street, but it was like a street or so over. And I didn't see it. But I, I found it to be weird that the cat, I mean, certainly was encroaching, but it wasn't really threatening anyone. And I remember my parents telling me, from reading the newsletter that we had gotten about uh, the controlling efforts of it, they killed it for no reason. And I was like, Oh, they could have just like transferred it, but probably someone complained. And also I think I had read recently about mountain lions in California is that more of them in like the San Gabriel portion of the state in the, the national forest over there are dying from like third degree uh, poisoning. And you can correct me if I'm mistaken, but a lot of, uh, because there's no active management system in place because they instituted the ban. I think it was after, I think it was in the 90s. Um, and then I know the last like truly conservation minded game warden uh, left in 2012, 2013, because he went hunting for mountain lions in Idaho. And there's that importation ban uh, in California as well. So I think um, around the time I left, that was when I left California. And it's just, I keep hearing now that the the population of cats is dwindling because they're becoming susceptible to this poison, uh, ingesting this poison. Uh, I think it's rat poison or, or some sort of poisonous uh, substance and they can be certainly controlled more humanely uh, without having to ingest this toxic uh, substance that they do. Yeah, that's hundred percent true. And the thing, some of the poisons they're ingesting now are what my team fought in California that, um, you know, the whole hidden more topic, what I talked to Joe Rogan about that Wayne and I actually talked about on his Warden's Watch podcast when, uh, when we started to collaborate last year, it's, it's these banned EPA banned poisons that cartels are using from south of the border in these clandestine marijuana grows. And they're all over so much of the forest in California is an example that where are those lions going for any real habitat left that isn't on a green belt next to a park or a housing development like we're used to live. And they're going where they're finding water and something they can eat and they're ingesting these poisons and generic rat poisons from people's yards and everything else. And to your point, that's exactly right. There's a lot more humane way to take these animals. doesn't matter where you sit on the fence the spectrum of hunt, don't hunt, conserve, preserve. Nobody wants to see an animal die of poison. It is a horrifying death. I've seen it as a warden. Wayne's seen it. It's just, it's just horrible, horrible stuff. So um, when you have a state that's that's thriving or was thriving on a mountain lion population or any type of predator and you get that management in there, um, it, it's something the public really needs to see because even an anti-hunting sentiment doesn't want to see a poison animal. It's, it's, a, it's a graphic, gory experience. and It's just heartbreaking. So... And that's the result of that emotional management versus scientific management. Right. And then my fear is, you know, their, their solution is to t- take a professional hunter and, and, and that's how we're going to, we're, we're going to limit these cats or we're going to limit these animals with a professional hunter and not let the sportsmen get back into the arena. And that, that's what I've seen is the solution. And I'm, I'm just not liking it. I think that's a trend. And I think that's what I want to fight all I can because, the, you know, we're going to destroy ourselves by doing that, by not having that engagement, not lo- losing our heritage in hunting. And also, hunters are conservationists. And you certainly hit that, Gabrielle. You say that conservation, you, you, you preach what I preach, that preservation, conservation, two different things. This is how we manage for a healthy population. And at such a young age, I'm so excited that you're doing that because you can you can speak to the millennials where they look at me and John and we're just a couple of old game wardens talking about this, where you <laughs> they actually say, well, we should maybe listen to her. She's got some good points. And that's, that's exciting about having you on our show and having you talk about those. Getting back to that grizzly bear thing, because I'm, I'm not really in 
you know, engaged in that because that's kind of out of my realm too. John, you're in the midst and it sounds like, Gabriella, that you are on top of that as well. Yeah, I think, I don't know if you guys heard the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals actually ruled against the Fish and Wildlife Service and the other uh, co-patrons of that lawsuit. So there unfortunately is a setback. I wonder if it will go to the Supreme Court. Uh, but it goes to and draws to a larger issue where Congress can come in and actually help allow the states to manage these recovered species with more ease. There is an effort to modernize the Endangered Species Act, which is the prevailing law which oversees imperiled, threatened, or endangered species. And when you have these protections and these creatures are fully recovered, they don't get removed off the list because different interests, especially preservationist groups like Defenders of Wildlife, Earth Justice, Sierra Club, and others who don't like hunting, it's pretty well known that they are wholly opposed to hunting. They come in, they file these lawsuits on behalf of plaintiffs. They could, I think sometimes they do exploit Native American tribes, they exploit some landowners, they exploit some stakeholders, and really kind of get them in and, and use them to perpetually keep these uh, recovered species locked into this list. And according to findings right now, only 3% of listed or listed, excuse me, threatened or endangered species have successfully been delisted. And it raises the question, what is the ESA doing? Is it actually fulfilling its function? Is it helping to recover species? Or is it being used by these interests to stay relevant, especially as public opinion starts to hopefully change when people realize that uh, they're not using science, they're relying mostly on emotional appeals, but they're using the courts and the judicial system with laws like the uh, EAJA, I forget the exact spelling out of what it means, but they're using certain laws in the books to serially litigate to keep these animals forever stuck with ESA protections because they worry that it's going to be managed by a managed hunt or it's going to be managed away from the federal government, more so in the rightful place of the states. Although the federal government still technically oversees because states, even if they're tackling management of certain species in regions, uh, the federal government still oversees it because they're giving states excise taxes, money for conservation funding. So people forget that there's still an interconnectedness even when a state takes over responsibility with managing a fully recovered imperiled species. Hmm. That's a... Uh... Pretty interesting, and I didn't know that uh, that that had come down either. Grizzly bears aren't my forte, I will say that. Talk about black bears all day, <laughs> but uh, nothing in my backyard. All right, John, they're, they're all in your backyard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they kind of are now, but Gabriella, to get to your point, it, I mean, it doesn't even, you can take the species out of it. Um, I think the point you made on ESA, and I know in California, I know Wayne did it back on the East Coast. We worked with the Endangered Species Act on so many cases, on high profile cases. For me, it was corporate development in a, in a watershed. And it was everything from the Stevens kangaroo rat to this particular type of, of brush or shrub. And then it becomes some mammal um, or the burrowing owl was a big one in the Silicon Valley where I was from. And to your point of how those species are kind of used by certain groups, whether it's lobbyists, whether it's um, you know, retaining relevancy, um, whether it's just what Wayne just said on that emotional versus scientific look on, I'd hate to see people go out to hunt them and have to kill them themselves at the state level. I just don't like the idea of people doing that. I don't know why I don't like the idea of people doing that, but it, it rubs me the wrong way. So we don't want to manage it that way. Even though from a sportsman and a, and a regulation management thing, at each agency level in the states, it would be a very viable, safe, ethical, and kind of um, unifying, we certainly think, a unifying method to go ahead and control some of those species for the benefit of the species. But we, we just get to that same roadblock every time, and I certainly saw it in California. I'm sure we see it in the East. I'm sure you remember from SoCal and now what you're seeing politically. And that's exactly what we're up against with the mountain lion. It's what we're up against with the, uh, the grizzly bear here. I speak from experience being an avid hunter up here and a conservationist in a very hunting oriented community of Northwestern Montana. And you can imagine some of the frustration you get with what the populace is saying versus what politics are saying and where the roadblock is. And I can honestly say it, I, I wasn't surprised because the ninth circuit is kind of from my old background area where that happened, that I didn't see that being a win on the conservation side. I was kind of a pessimist and it looks like that's how it went. And, and like you said, I hope it does get to the point where at the Supreme Court level, these issues get addressed in this modern era 
to hopefully get a better balance across the board and, and hopefully um, let, let the emotional side that we've been talking about kind of take back seat to the scientific scientific side and um and everything you're doing is helping with that so kudos but a, a lot of these laws were created back when people had more were more engaged in the outdoors and now when we decided to change them to, or reverse them our bobcat season got closed in new hampshire and the hunters and the trappers yeah. wanted to close it because they saw the population was at a point where they thought it needed to be closed well, now the bi- population seems to be thriving and trying to reopen it has been a challenge on both. Ends. You know, there could, there could have been some th- things done better as far as presentation to the, the public and things like that. And that's what I'm seeing where a lot of things are slacking as far as engagement with these fish and game agencies is to engage the public, uh, to modernize, is uh, <laughs> they, they, to Zoom. It's funny that they have to Zoom now. <laughs> I'm glad we forced them to Zoom. <laughs> But, you know, I always say it takes 20 years to make change, John. I don't know if you agree, but uh, and my, my yeah. friend Colonel Jordan will laugh at that because I tell him that all the time. But, yeah. but to engage and, new uh, ideas. Yeah, to that, <laughs> yeah and, and to that point, Gabriella, we have a saying, my, uh, my good friend and retired chief Nancy Foley, who was um, one of our chiefs a couple terms ago in California before I retired, has a saying that she used to tell all of us. It, it's that change is inevitable, but growth is optional. And nobody likes change typically, especially in these old salt law enforcement agencies, Wayne and I come from, we've seen it. So Wayne spot on, it is about 20 years, sometimes longer on progress, (laughs) but it's, it's seen if we can actually grow as a country and adapt to the changing world of what we have environmentally. And with the impacts of urbanization, the limited number of green belts, I mean, we're going to make or break these wildlife species and it's not going to be hunters that drive them out or, you know, cause extinction or overtake, especially with how regulated all these states are with conservation agencies, right? On the federal level, on the marine federal and state and local levels. So with what you're doing and what you see from the conservation model working um, and being on the ground with quote unquote, not, not us old dinosaurs, like Wayne said, but the millennial generation, what do you think is the solution and where do you think people need to put their focus on? If you could tell any public member, say a kid that's 12, 14, 15, even 20, that hasn't really spent much time in the outdoors, how do you approach that? And what would be the basic building block steps to get exposure and, and what do we do moving forward? Right. Yes. Because there has been a lot of talk about hunting possibly facing its own semblance of extinction. There was that pretty damning report in 2017, 2018 from the Fish and Wildlife Service showing a decline in hunting. Although I think initial numbers have now shown it started to kind of trickle back up. Uh, But we'll see, I think, within the next five years since that report that came out, uh, if the efforts for recruitment, retention, reactivation are actually working, if they're reaching new audiences, if they're appealing to millennials, urbanites, um, non-traditional demographics. And it is an arduous task, but it's not impossible, I think, if people do branding correctly. And I think state wildlife agencies, I've seen most of them do this, but One pet peeve of mine is if I'm going to fish in a state and I want to go download the wildlife agency app and I see that there's no complement to it. Here in Virginia, we have a great app. I think also Georgia has a great app. I've fished and hunted there before. Uh, Maryland is still lacking with an app. West Virginia is kind of lacking with an app. So you have to, I think that's also a, a thing when you talked about modernization. I think a lot of these entities and departments are realizing that in order to attract new people, they have to modernize because people my age and younger love shiny, bright things. They like having things at their fingertips. We want to see, I think even people younger want to be able to, if they're wanting to learn how to hunt, how to fish or explore different opportunities in their states, they want to see social media activity. And it's really great that most wildlife agencies are starting to have a presence on the different platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, especially denoted by a blue check mark. And it's really great that uh, the social media companies have made that possible so people can properly identify and connect and follow. But we're seeing that transition, I think, happen um, over the last five years or so, which is a great first step because a lot of people, uh, they want discoverability when it comes to learning how to go into the outdoors. We also see a lot of corporations and companies partnering with, uh, let's say, tr- uh, mainstream brand. So I think I saw something where it was like an outdoor company branding with a beer company 
and just combining those two interests to produce different types of content, like showing different types of outdoor recreationists. So I think one episode I saw was a hiker and a hunter and they go on this adventure. And I think that's a good way to also bring in people too. And then just the various different efforts, let's say more urban outreach efforts, Take Me Fishing, which is a project of Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation. Uh, last year had a really great uh, pop-up across different cities across the country. They took like this little cute fishing hub to different points of interest. They went to New York City. They went to Minneapolis. They held an event here in the D.C. area at one of my favorite places called Burke Lake. And they just were able to have a cute little shop, very interactive for social media. If you want to post about it, say that you went there, use a hashtag, whatnot. And it had a lot of like free lures. It gave kids candy, gave information on how to go fishing. It had a clinic for people who wanted to learn how to fish. So like when you combine very nice, like, uh, interactive hubs and encourage people to post about it on social media and with the hopes of it being discovered and then similarly waging a video campaign, you can draw in people there. And I think with social media too, because it's still this kind of new medium, it's ever changing. People are wondering if it has too much rest and control on our lives and arguably it does at times and it gets, it get, and because of this uh, proliferation of this readily absorbable information and distractions with apps social media uh, platforms and whatnot, uh, we have, I think, I think that also contributes to the decline of fishing and hunting, although I think people are trying to counteract that now. But for a long time, I think people blamed the decline in participation with the rise of these apps, with video games, other distractions in the technological sense. So I think there's a way where you could attack this in a way, like I mentioned, there are efforts in the industry We'll see how those are going to have an effect. Uh, but there are recruitment campaigns. There's field to fork programs. I think you guys are very aware of those. And it's kind of like this uh, field to table initiative. People love eating food. They love eating artisanal type cuts of meat. Um, they love to blend it with grains and lettuce and vegetables. And there's kind of this burgeoning movement of growing your own produce, like especially in this time. I've had a lot of friends. Right grow vegetables and people want to have everything organically and locally sourced. So hunting and fishing have kind of latched onto these other interesting subsets of food and culture to kind of bring that in. And you now see a lot more wild game chefs. I'm friends with a few prominent wild game chefs and they've partnered with bigger companies. They've gone onto mainstream media sources to talk about their efforts and share the good word about eating what you catch. I wrote about this at town hall and I spoke to the Pennsylvania Game Commission about this, and I spoke to a few wild, what, or excuse me, wild game chefs and some other individuals, and a lot of people have said that they've been building upon this to draw in more people because that's a good way to appeal to young people. So using social media, kind of making the experience interactive, companies like Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's have actually really been great at putting out ads. I think uh, Bass Pro Shop put an ad early on in this COVID season that really just was pulling at the heartstrings and made you want to go outdoors. And I just loved seeing that ad. It was one of my favorite ads to see because <laughs> everything was so depressing about, we miss you. We, we know that you're adjusting to this and it's tough times, but it was kind of a glimmer of hope, positive ad. And it just kind of uh, talked about the appeal of being in the outdoors. So if you're using new technological means to enhance old worldly traditional activities like hunting and fishing, foraging and whatnot. Uh, I think that's how you can continue to lure in more people. And also we see oddly enough, a lot of these mainstream publications, I think most recently it was Washington post, not a very friendly source to hunting that had a art that had an article that said that without hunters, endangered species are going to go further instinct that was their premise i was like this is very odd to see washington post write about but kudos <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and the new york times talked about recently how uh, fishing is a great socially distanced uh, responsible recreation activity so everyone is now like rediscovering fishing like they never had seen it before it was never really done and i'm like okay these activities are timeless a lot of us had done it but Hey, you city dwelling people, like you more common city dwelling folks, like kudos for finally like admitting that these activities have inherent value. People enjoy them. They're great for stress relieving purposes. It's great to be out in nature. It's good for your health. You can get some protein if you decide to catch your fishing catch. 
or keep your fishing catch or if you're hunting to locally source and help manage, let's say, a uh, ravenous deer population or wild hog population. And so I think certain mainstream outlets and entities are recognizing that maybe we shouldn't have badgered these activities or maybe we took it a little bit too far with this environmental push to discourage these type of activities from happening. I don't know exactly long term what that will have if they'll uh, we'll really see any long term changes, but maybe there are some inklings of people who wield a lot of influence, maybe backtracking on any assumption they had about these uh, hook and bullet type activities. But I think I think there is some hope, but I think it's just a matter of companies not abandoning these principles, but perhaps reaching out to different audiences while still maintaining their virtues and their principles, but at a modern twist, having nicely done videos, polishing their social media accounts, uh, working with good, effective influencers, because a lot of the time, a lot of the times companies will work with people who don't know how to fish or hunt or who mislead about their ability to go hunting or how expert of a hunter they are. So companies working with great influencers, some people that come to mind for me that are ex excellent, effective people. These are two women that are good friends of mine, Jana Waller of the Sportsman Channel. She's phenomenal. And also Christy yeah. Titus, who works with Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. So like influencers like that who can speak to different audiences and really draw people in through their storytelling prowess. So that's a lot to digest. I threw a lot out there, but I think uh, combining traditional new media, working with people who are established and taking these ideas to the city. That's what I try to do here. I try to populate this on my social accounts. I try to talk to people in the region and, and to put this out on social media because so much of uh, social media is occupied by what's the response to what's happening in Washington from a political edge. Uh, what's the latest outrage to respond to now? What uh, Teddy Roosevelt monument are people going to deface? So people have <laughs> this kind of reactionary thing and they're not caring about these more cherished, important issues like what we all are concerned about, about preserving this livelihood, continuing traditions, growing participant numbers. Uh, so I think um, we all, me from a media standpoint, you guys through the podcast and through your previous work as wardens, you have to just continue to put this out there and try to occupy a space and, and grab the attention of newsmakers. I think we can do that and break out rather than just have it be a story of how, let's say, a hunter poached. Because a lot of the times our issues only come about when people are poaching and, and doing wrong practices with respect to conservation. It's very rarely positive unless if it's like a young kid catching a really nice bass. I saw a great video of a young man from Florida who caught a beautiful trophy bass like nine or 10 pounds and he was excited and it was just really cool to see that, that video. But I think um, we just have to continue to populate and, and try to break into this 24 seven news cycle more and not just about responding to negative stories, but trying to highlight positive stories. Yeah. Th those are all great, great approaches. Um, and something you mentioned, Jenna Waller, she's a friend of mine as well. We're both sponsored by certain companies and her Skullbound TV show. And that's what I'm going to bring up is you bring legitimate, credible women like yourself, like Jana, inside promoting conservation outside of just the, you know, the traditional macho, go kill an animal, you know, bring <laughs> it back, feed the family, you know, getting, getting into a bigger, uh, a bigger message. And I'm finding that to your point of, sponsors in the outdoor industry, like several of my sponsors for our Thin Green Line film series, want to see that. And when they saw the first film, they came right back and said, you know what, this is exactly what we want to see because we want the hipsters, we want the millennials, we want the non-hunters going, oh man, I'm going to get involved in this. This is done really, um, really professionally. The visuals are great. The, you know, the production value is up there, but more importantly, the message is not a killing message. You know, that is almost the downplayed part of that story. And, and Wayne and I see this in Northwood's Law and Wild Justice, getting those producers and reality TV for game wardens to tell positive conservation stories where we're not just busting a felony, you know, drug addict that's out there poaching animals or, or doing something heinous because it brings a good rating because it's an exciting story of us taking somebody to jail. There's, there's so many positives to the message, I think, that we're all about that people aren't seeing um, as a whole from the, from the general population and definitely not equating hunters with killers, uh, a less desirable person out there. They're just kind of like afraid of the woods being doing their thing. Um, that's been a real uphill battle. I know it's been an uphill battle for Wayne and I and, and all the wardens we work with nationally, especially in big population states like where you and I are at. 
and then getting that message out through actual product sponsors that really fuel the hunting industry and we make their living basically. So those changes seem to be really good. They seem to be starting to happen out of necessity and also out of real motivation. And again, kind of that unifying thing that, that you're coming at and we got to just keep going with it. But I, I, I agree with you hundred percent. It's, it's got to stay and we got to put the gas down on the floor and hit it hard, you know, if we're going to make any real headway uh, in the next decade. Just seems like now is the time. And now uh, I, I think you're right. I think guys are hitting it in drive. I think agencies are hitting it in drive. I give a shout out to the Vermont Game Wardens. They just started an Instagram page. And I don't know where they're getting these pictures, but they are yeah. phenomenal. <laughs> Oh my goodness, they're doing such a good job. I, I feel humbled by the photos they are getting. They yeah. had a lot of people engaged in that, and they, they're showing some things that people don't get to see often. And it's it's just the, the message is get out there and and, and enjoy and, and jump in. It's, it's some type of an intimidation factor too, which I think, Gabriella, you've overcome. Because yes. just even the intimidation to get into that firearms thing, I, I know we we shoot sporting clays, we shoot trap. My wife does it, but it was that initial break into it was very intimidating for her and even my son. So, and just going to my local fishing game club, those guys are great. They 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 were very happy to see young people come, very happy to see a female come, and it just took, you know, because again, dad and uh, your husband isn't the best person to teach you how to do things. So, those guys were great <laughs> at taking them under their wing and. And breaking down, you know, it, it's hard, you know, to break into hunting. It's easy to get fishing. It, it, you grab a fishing pole, yes. you grab a worm, you go out there and you get hooked. Hunting's another thing. There's a lot more to it. So to get those engaging right, right. type of social media out there and then giving them opportunity. I was a little, the, the apprentice license that came up, I was a little apprehensive of that, but I can see its value now and I can see that's setting the hook. That's that's putting the worm on and setting the hook for people to go out there yep. with an experienced hunter and get that feeling without having to go through the hunter safety course to see, because that's a lot of commitment. Do I want to commit that much? I'd like to try it first. And that apprentice program right. has done so much nationwide that, and I was apprehensive of forests. I'm like, I don't know about taking someone out there that hasn't had hunter safety, but they're going with an experienced hunter. So it's been great. It's engaging. Uh, John's part of becoming an outdoors woman, which again, what an engaging Very thing nice. to break down that intimidation yeah. factor. Uh, just, just a huge, huge thing. And that's what we, we got to get out there to people, break it down, come and join us. You know, we're here to help. Oh, and, and you were doing that, I think, just by doing it. Like, like you said, at 19, you started getting out there and shooting and get other people engaged in that. And the knowledge of firearms is what we need out there because people are scared of firearms. And that's what's driving our restrictions on firearms. It's not the firearms that's killing people. It's the person behind the firearm. Absolutely. That, that knowledge of having that firearm and how it works we break down that intimidation factor. Now it's a tool, just like the carpenter has a hammer. It's a tool that does something, and we need to do it safely. But it's that intimidation, that fear, because the way it's used by those people that are using it incorrectly, uh, criminally, to, to speak to. And that's hard for us to get our message out. It's, I think it's going to be easier for you to engage your generation. And I think you're at the beginning of your career. I, I, I you know, I see great things happening for you and I'm excited for you. And it's just, uh, I'm, I'm just glad there's somebody at your age grabbing that torch and being out there, being engaged, being on social media where we need to be and knowing Knowing all those things that you said, this is where I need where where we should target, and you're doing it, and that's that's just awesome, and I'm I'm really happy that you're doing it. I'm just one small fish, but I I want to serve as a good example that let's say other women, urban dwellers, people interested in public policy, really do kind of latch on and and run with this issue. In terms of drawing people in, I actually just invested in a very expensive camera, a Sony Alpha. And I nice. love, I'm, I'm kind of an amateur photographer. I, I guess I can consider myself that. And when I'm not like behind uh, a gun, I guess, or, or behind the rod or, or, or I guess uh, in, engaged in the field, I should say, I like to be behind the lens too and film stuff. I just filmed a video, like kind of a mini documentary of a really beautiful resort in West Virginia. And they have a fly fishing trophy trout stream and they offer nice. hunting outfitting uh, opportunities and they're right on the north fork of the south bend 
the, the Potomac River where there's really great historical trout fishing. They're home to the golden rainbow trout. Uh, and it's it was just really fun to tell their story. But I bought the camera for business purposes and also to polish my uh, photo taking abilities because I love shooting uh, wildlife as well. Um, not simply to, to uh, get meat, but I also like it from the hobbyist standpoint too, because to, to have that well-roundedness about the species, let's say you're targeting or you wanna hunt or appreciate, you have to also appreciate them from a observational standpoint. I got to view Virginia's elk herd about a year ago and just seeing them bugle and in this recreated <laughs> habitat from reclaimed coal mines, it was just so breathtaking and I wasn't like crying tears of joy or anything, but it was just so mesmerizing just to see this haziness and to see about 200 to 250 of these beautiful elk, some spike elk, uh, cows and uh, young, young elk uh, just frolicking there. Like they've been there for a long time. It's just so cool to see that. And I shared that story recently on film. And then also I wrote a really lengthy piece about it, about, just how these coal miners and other people who work in extractive industries care so deeply about these elk uh, while all the while preserving their livelihood. And that's not a perspective you often hear because a lot of people say, well, to conserve wildlife, you have to stop doing this. But there's actually this principle that people forget we have in this country called balanced use or multiple use management, sustained yield management. And you see that a lot on the East Coast, especially with these reclaimed coal fields and elk being re reintroduced into the area. We've had this here in Virginia, and it's been happening in North Carolina, although theirs is more so in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. But uh, it's just seeing that intersection of different interests, uh, people you would think that would be conflicting uh, interests, coming together with one another to rehabilitate this elk population because there was an Eastern strain of elk in Virginia in the late 1800s. And because of market game hunting, they became decimated and virtually extinct. And then because of efforts by the wildlife agency, private property owners, local chapter of Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation volunteers and energy representatives, they came together and realized in the early 2010s to bring this species back. So just, I think also people can learn about hunting and what hunters do and, and how they conserve and they preserve habitats is by going to these type of immersion events. So I went to, it was an elk rendezvous event and these people go hunting. Some of them don't go hunting, but a large chunk of them go hunting. They work in these industries, which would seem to be uh, anathema to, to wildlife conservation, but you see that intersection and that story not really getting too much attention. So I figured I would tell that story. The New York Times recently talked about Kentucky's efforts to rehabilitate the elk uh, with these reclaimed coal mines. But that's also a perspective, a good way to uh, make people kind of attentively read into these efforts and that hunters are behind this. They're not just shooting and they're not just killing. They're actually helping to preserve habitat, helping to educate people about how to keep the health of let's say a uh, Rocky Mountain elk in this new habitat flourishing and happy. And actually in Virginia, uh, we had a bill go into law recently that will actually allow us to have a elk tag, elk lottery start to happen once the herd reaches 400 strong. I think we're at 250 now. So we'll soon be able to have an elk tag, uh, elk lottery uh, come about in Virginia probably in the next few years. And that's going to for a lot of economic activity, people can go view the elk and then they can also apply for this tag, whether they're residents or not residents, and just mm -hmm. continue to supply and keep the elk healthy and have their longevity be self-sustaining. So I think that's also a good way. And I like shooting bird photos, like birding I've gotten into a little bit. We have a lot of bald eagles in my neighborhood. I've gone to a dam in the Pennsylvania, Maryland region, Conowingo Dam, and it's mm -hmm. like the epicenter of eagle watching on the east coast it's nice. phenomenal like people will come from new york and the southeast and all these different regions sometimes even from abroad to go view the eagles and i've gone there and photographed them before and now with this new camera and this cool wildlife lens i have i want to do that more but also people forget that hunters don't simply just want to subtract from a population or help manage a population of a particular species we also are very careful and mindful of our surroundings. I really love watching wildlife. I watch foxes come to my backyard. I'll see red tail hawks. <laughs> I've seen raccoons and woodchucks and 
pileated woodpeckers. And so we, we admire everything. We're not just there. And primarily what we do is we're not going to be killing everything in sight or try to ensure its destruction. That's actually a little component to hunting and fishing. People forget. Mm. Uh, but it's about developing a reverence for the species we pursue, whether it's on land or in water. Uh, and it's just right. so multi-pronged and so fascinating. And, and that's something you can highlight through a social media channel. And I think you guys do that quite well on your social media channels as well. Highlighting, like the I saw Wayne that you posted about a dog recently, one of the Labradors, <laughs> encouraging yep. people to, to follow the theme green line. And it's just pictures can go a long way to humanize hunters and humanize anglers more and videos too. So I think the industry and the interagency uh, recognition of this is starting to really take hold. Anything you want to say in closing? We've gone about an hour here. I try to keep the shows about an hour. <laughs> sure. I think we were talking at the beginning of the show before going on air about Yellowstone. Yeah. The show on Paramount with Kevin Costner. Yes. yes. Yeah. Good topic. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 I wanted to delve into that with you guys. What are your thoughts on it? If you've watched it much or not? I think, uh, well, it's, I can safely say up in Montana, it's one of our favorite shows. Um, I just, just by design, Taylor Sheridan's one of my favorite directors because what he did it's with awesome. Wind River and what he did with Sicario, you take Sicario one and two and you take Wind River with Jeremy Renner, who was the closest thing. He wasn't really a game warden, but he was called a game warden, but he was really kind of a federal depredator for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service with a truck emblem. But to make someone of such character in conservation as an officer, but as a human being and a family man, Taylor Sheridan was the first guy to do that in modern film on the A-list level with that movie. And then to make Yellowstone and bring back conservation and bring back, you know, open, open land and the development impacts, I really do like it. I mean, certainly a lot of it is going to be embellished a little bit, you know, for the story. And there's certain things when they're determining, are they going to shoot that wolf you know, for cattle impacts, or are they not going to shoot that wolf like in the last couple of episodes? Um, mm -hmm. The grizzly bear stuff that happened last season, I think it was the yeah. first season. And, and I'm just going to laugh because the latest episode, you guys will probably laugh at this too, um, <laughs> that just, just aired Sunday night with the bikers in, in Dutton's Field. And when he asked, well, uh, where are you from? And he said, well, we're from California. And he said, figures. <laughs> it was just the mentality that we can just you know, no dig on California, but you know the political mentality that we can just jump over a fence and, and go anywhere we want. There's there's a lot of different elements that, that I think that show fires on a lot of cylinders. How about you guys? Yeah, for me it was uh, it's always a learning thing about learning about the the west side of the country. I have limited exposure out there. I've done some elk hunting out in Colorado. Fabulous. So. A, to see the scenery and see some of the same issues that apply there, that are here. And I was talking to Gabriella before that the, the fisherman in the river, when when he was uh, accosted by the landowner, and he's like, well, I'm in the river. Well, the bottom of the, right. ri the river isn't owned by the landowner. It's owned <laughs> by the state. Although I did tell her on the East Coast, there are some deeds that say that some people own the bottom of the yep. river. So you always got to look at the deed because that's 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 interesting part. But in New Hampshire, if it's a navigable body of water, it's technically owned by the state of New Hampshire. So it's and I'm, it sounds like it's the same out there. And land issues, East Coast versus West Coast, are very very different. Growing up in a state where if it's not posted, you can go. Uh, they actually get deductions in their taxes for recreational, leaving your land open for recreation so people can hunt and fish. So they get a deduction in their taxes. So a lot of your large landowners will keep land open just for the tax deduction, which is great. When they go out west and it's such an issue of which line you are on, that's very foreign to me. And definitely I can see why when we have uh, landlocked pieces of government land, why access is so important, which is another huge Western issue right. too, which we usually don't have a lot on the East Coast. And we have a lot in New Hampshire. They actually, and it's just been the past 10 years, I believe, that they actually have to have access to landlocked pieces now before they're sold. So they have to have right-of-ways through that. So, and then the the, 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 the stuff with right-of-ways, you know, being a game warden, John, I don't know if you engaged in a few of those things. Oh, I totally... Uh... Oh, yeah. yeah, complaints totally. on right-of-ways. Well, again, you look at the deed. What's the deed say? It, it says they have a right-of-way. It doesn't say they can use their ATVs up and down that right-of-way as much. It doesn't exclude ATVs. It, you know, But if it says right. in there they can only use a horse, and, a horse and carriage to get to their property, guess what? The, uh, everything I've seen, the judge looks at the deed. He goes, it's the deed. And, and judges don't like to change those types of things at all. One, one thing I see they don't like to change. <laughs> 
But those yeah, are the things yeah, that are, it's sure. spurred, and it's good for conversation. I think it's great that they work those things into it. You know, just like uh, Jack Carr works into his thriller books, you know, poaching right. issues in Africa, North America hunting. I just, I love that aspect of those types of things that people care enough to engage that in TV and in books. And that just, it's, it just shows a passion and it shows that there's a lot of people out there that are part of this thing, Green Line. And it, it's so great to engage them on a podcast like this, just like you, Gabriella. I love the work you're doing. You're doing great work. Uh, you're going great places. And uh, I'm just so happy that you're so young and engaging. So hopefully my son will do something like that as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, and I wanted to briefly add my thoughts on why I really have been drawn to the show. I, I'm like a Yellowstone evangelist. I've been an early adopter <laughs> since the beginning. I saw the advertising for it, I think, before it launched in June of 2018. And I was like, oh, my gosh, the draw of Kevin Costner, the cinematography, like all these little hooks. And just kind of how, although it is dramatized like we have talked about, um, there are some real world applications to the show. And I was reading an article in Deadline uh, with Taylor Sheridan, who is really uh, very different from a lot of his counterparts in Hollywood, where he wants to be as realistic. He wants to... He said, I think, something to the effect in this Deadline interview that there's no show about the ranching lifestyle and people wanting to work the land and how they have these challenges from developers contrasting interests, the challenges of dealing with ESA regulations, with encroachers and poachers and all this different stuff. So it does kind of bring in to light a lot of the Western issues and even some of the Eastern issues. We do sometimes have land management issues. We have a lot of coaching incidences so it does kind of tap into that and and really give a face to the greater issues kind of that we experience and see in this conservation angle and I think the show just got renewed for a fourth season it's nice. phenomenal and nice. if you're a little sensitive to some of the content like it's not as bad as like Game of Thrones I'm really glad that right. they're a little more uh, cognizant of that it's not as gory right. and violent as like a Game of Thrones but there is some sensitive nature to it, but it, it's mostly acceptable for most audiences. And just my family loves it too. And people have started to watch it. And they're finally, I think, going to be given Emmy consideration after three seasons. It's taken forever. Mm. And it's just, it's just amazing that more people are gravitating towards the show, even those who have nothing to do with our in- issues or industry. Mm. No, I, I, I agree. And, and to stay on that topic, because I think it's, it's proximate to – the message we're trying to get out that we love so much when you talk about wildlife waterways and wildlands and the thin green line is there's no bigger audience to reach the non outdoor public than a hit TV show that's going around the world on a major network or even more so the motion pictures, whether it's a stream series on Netflix um, it's, you know, on animal planet or Nat Geo, like, like the shows Wayne and I have been lucky to be involved in Mm -hmm. that did so much for game wardens. And and you're right. Taylor Sheridan is one of those guys that really gets it. He's authentic. He's not contrived. Um, And ultimately it doesn't matter where you sit on private land encroachment or any of those issues that Yellowstone brings up. Everything about how beautiful our wildland resources are on the John Dutton Ranch and what he says to Tate, his grandson, what Cody, Jamie, Beth, the whole kids are, have had to fight through with all the drama they've been through. Ultimately, it comes down to those cinematic scenes of we have basically, it's been life or death, our whole existence as a family to keep this. And they show that sunset on a trout creek with fly fishing or the kids are walking off with their fly rods or they're taking a you know lever action to go look for a wolf that might be encroaching. Um, there's nothing like that on TV in mainstream, you know, and I think um, it's been underrepresented and I think it balances out everything else you see on a different spectrum without going into too much detail um, in other areas. So it's, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I missed that part of the conversation with you guys, but it's a fun topic <laughs> to talk about. And, uh, and Wayne, if you haven't seen Wind River, watch Wind River. It's, it is so game warden friendly to the, to the point of um, what we stand for. It's pretty cool. I wrote, from the same I wrote it down because I haven't seen it. <laughs> oh yeah. It's heavy. It's a heavy one. Yep. Yeah. Great. So, well, super. But Gabriella, so good to have, super cool to have you on and we'll definitely continue to work together, stay mm. in touch. Yeah. Um, we'll be following you and follow us on social media and anything Absolutely. we can do together 
moving forward, we're one big family in this thin green line and whatever we can do to help you or vice versa, let's collaborate because um, with the Zoom technology, we're a lot closer than we, uh, than we are, no doubt. In, you know, 10 years ago. So no I would absolutely love to. I This type of format really does allow us to have this interconnectedness to work together and anywhere, like I said, I can help you guys. I want to be able to do that too. I, I also host a video series, Conservation Nation, where I try to explore this and highlight positive stuff. Nice. I would always love to have more sources, uh, former wardens like yourself, current wardens for articles. So if I can help elevate your colleagues and give their perspective, I would love to do that. But it's been such a pleasure to speak with you both. I am really excited to see what people think of the episode and what I do. And this is just a, a smidgen of what I do. I could talk about any other subject if we had more time for sure. But I would love to talk more with you guys and help you as well if I can. It's been a pleasure to chat with you.